Hello, hello. My name is April Malone, and I'm with Yes, I Work From Home, and this is the podcast. Today, I have Dan Wheeler from North Carolina with me. And Dan, you're just going to have to tell people what you do because I don't think I caught all of that. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Wheeler, and I am a professional services consultant for a company called Proofpoint. Uh, I I like to think they are the number one rated email security company in the world. Gartner certainly rates us pretty high. Uh, But professional services consultant is just a really fancy way of saying that uh, I am essentially an implementation engineer. I I get our customers from when they purchase the product to the point where our products are completely in use and, and configured the way our customers like them. I am also something of a troubleshooter. I am given a lot of odd tasks and, and random jobs to help our customers out with. So was it like integration, kind of like Zapier, where you put the pieces together and make them run smoothly? Very, very much like that, yes. Uh, Proofpoint's main product is an email security system that essentially sits between the internet and our customers' email endpoints, i.e. their exchange servers, their Outlook inboxes. So we intercept oh, email right. from the internet, and if it's bad, we block it. If it's good, we let it through. So do you work with um, some of the big hitters as far as like big companies and it's kind of like that? I think when I worked for uh, Mayo Clinic, we had some service like that where if it found an attachment or something like that, it would. That is precisely what our products are doing. It, it, we have other products as well, but that is what our focus is. Right. Okay. So Dan and I have a mutual friend and I had just interviewed Jen Hughes a few weeks weeks ago. Um, her episode was probably just a couple of before yours. So, um, but we don't know each other in real life. We just have a mutual friend and I'm thankful that you're able to come on here today because we actually need, need to know more about internet and email and all of that sort of thing, security from home. Cause a lot of people work for an organization and they just take care of all of that. And then you got the entrepreneurs and the people who are starting their own small business. And, uh, there's probably a lot of, uh, scary open things that people aren't thinking about. Like, for instance, me. <laughs> I, you know, once I um, turned in all of my information or turned in all of my equipment to Mayo Clinic when, when they downsized my department and I decided to go ahead and move on, um, I basically turned in my Cisco box and they had, you know, the VPNs and all the things that that was the security. And now I don't have that. So teach us. <laughs> so uh, you bring up an interesting point when you mentioned this, this quote unquote Cisco box. That sounds to me like a, a sort of either a VPN encryption system or, or a way to connect to a specific network. And that is one mm-hmm. of the most important things you can have security wise if you are working from home, either a dedicated network line or a VPN, which stands for virtual private network. Uh, VPN is a method where you set up a a public and private encryption key pair, and and I'll get more on that in just a minute, Uh, and and you talk to a, a, a server on your corporate environment while encrypting that communication traffic. Uh, Public and private key pairs come from a, a mathematical solution that was discovered in the late 70s, where essentially you have two different mathematical problems, and one of them is reversible only via the other. So essentially, you have what is called a private key, and if you encrypt information with this private key, the public key can decrypt that information, but nothing else can. And the reverse is true as well. The public key can decrypt the information from the private key, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, the, the, the private key can decrypt information from the public key, uh, and nothing else can. So it is essentially a way of sharing something with another party and saying, when you talk to us, use this to to hide or, or encrypt the information, and we are the only ones that can decrypt that then. Okay. I appreciate you bringing it back to layman's terms because <laughs> um, that's not my field of you know, Not a knowledge. problem. I'm happy to do that. And, and in fact, sometimes that is part of my job. Um, the, the technical expertise of my customers spans the gamut from, yeah, we're in IT, but we barely know anything to they might even be at least as good as I am, if not better. Right. Okay. So talk to us a little bit about... Um, 
how you started working from home, Yeah, because assuming you have been. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I have been working from home 100% since I joined Proofpoint. Uh, I worked for a mid-sized bank before that, and I was commuting every day. I was driving about 10 miles, uh, a 20 to 25 yeah. minute commute. And uh, the company that I worked for was actually a customer of the company I work for now. Uh, our, okay. our sales representative and I were talking just very casually one day after a meeting. And almost jokingly, I brought up, do you guys have an office in the area? You, you seem like a fantastic company to work for. And, and he completely serious said, well, most of our positions are work from home these days and directed me to a website. And lo and behold, three months later, I was working from home 100%. Uh, so who recruited who there? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, well, funny story. Uh, uh, the position that he had directed me to uh, was, was actually not one that was a good fit. And it uh -huh. turns out that a coworker I worked with in New York City back in the late 90s actually worked for this same company as well, worked for Proofpoint. And he directed me to the position I eventually got. And it turned out to be a boon for him because he got a referral bonus. Oh, right. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it, it turns out they are a fantastic company to work from home for. They have corporate offices uh, uh, all around the world, actually. We are a worldwide organization. And... Uh, but working from home uh, uh, turned out to be a, a fantastic transition. I was very nervous about it because I had never worked from home full time before. Uh, they happened to have a stipend where they helped me buy extra monitors and a desk uh, for my home nice. office. And there, not everybody gets that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a big packet of information that was sent to me. I got sent a laptop with with most of the security tools built in. And the first week was essentially orientation, where we would sit on on Zoom sessions and work with IT to configure our equipment to the point where it was usable for work. Right, and obviously it would need to be very secure. Yes, because you're in the business of security. Yes, absolutely. So I, I sign on to a, a, a VPN every morning. Uh, and that uses what is called two-factor authentication. And mm -hmm. uh, to, we use two-factor authentication with a physical token. Uh, I, I can actually show you a, a video of that right here. You know, my um, when I worked for Mayo Clinic, they mailed out one of those to everybody. And for whatever reason, I think my department didn't end up having to use it, but it was there and ready. So th this physical token generates a random number every 60 seconds that is required to to log into uh, uh, our company's servers. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we we obviously keep extremely strong passwords. We are encouraged to, to use uh, fairly complex passwords. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, finally, in order to access anything sensitive, I have to have a combination of my normal login, this security token, and a a Remember how I mentioned just a few minutes ago the public and private key pair? I had to generate yeah. my own private key, and and my public key is is actually living out there on our corporate network and confirms uh, with yet another method I am who I say I am. So this sounds like three-factor authentication. It, it is, actually, yes. Did I say that right? No, no, uh, <laughs> you absolutely did. And, and uh, <laughs> essentially, the more factors you add, the more secure you, you are assuming those factors are unique. Uh, okay. There, there is a, a recent study that shows two-factor authentication, if it is on the same device, essentially is useless. If that device is compromised, it, it, it really doesn't mm. matter if you have two-factor authentication because threat actors, bad guys, can, can get to that uh, device by one stop and they have... That's why they text you on your phone exactly. or call your phone. Yes, if your phone is dead or lost, then you're kind of up the river. Exactly. No, no, that, that, that is correct. If, if your primary access point is compromised, it doesn't matter if you have multi-factor authentication if all of those factors live in the same point. Okay. Well, that gives me a lot to think about. Why don't you just keep talking? <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, so... Uh, I got started out working from home, and it, it was extremely different uh, from from the the normal uh, button desk job that that a, a lot yeah. of folks have. Um, first off, uh, I, I was trained for almost three months before I first started to engage with customers. Um, wow. I, I was doing what we called shadowing uh, other other people in my role pretty much full time for the first two months. And, and then I, I, I had to pass certification exams and tests. And, and at that point, I took my first customer call 
And let me tell you, I was extremely nervous. This, this was a new setup for me. I had never worked from that side of the, the chair in implementing customers. Uh, and, and it, it was fairly nerve wracking those first few sessions where I was live, I was leading a meeting, I was uh, walking customers through our product to configure them, working with them to get their organizational needs w w built into that configuration. Uh, and now almost two years later, uh, my my schedule, as I mentioned earlier, is pretty much completely full. I, I have mm -hmm. a minimum of 32 hours of customer facing time a week and those are all hard scheduled to the point where I, I don't think I have a free hour before the end of November at, at this point wow. in time. And, and that's fairly typical for me. Uh, do you generally do uh, like conference calls or phone calls or do you do face-to-face uh, -face, like Zoom sessions and stuff? Both. Uh, it, it is always audio of, of some sort. Uh, my... My direct boss encourages us to use a, a video conferencing uh, just because it, it is a, a level of reassurance for people that they can see you. They can know that you are a real human on the other end rather than just, you know, some guy sitting in a blank office wearing a headset who's just a voice on the phone. Okay. Uh, yeah. But uh, in, in addition to that, very often people are sharing out their screens and I am directing them to, to make certain changes. Okay. Uh, on rare occasion, a, a customer will share out their screen and I will ask for permission to control their computer. Uh, typically, mm -hmm. this is because if I have to log in with a higher level security account or if I'm typing out a very complex command and I just don't want to spell it out over the course of a minute, it, it's much faster for me to just type it. Right. I'm curious, do you use Zoom? I know that there's a lot of security concerns with that platform or do you use something different? Uh, Proofpoint's default corporate communication method is Zoom. Uh, okay. We have our own dedicated Zoom, uh, what is called an instance, meaning that uh, we have preset security keys, we, we have a certain license package, and we have been guaranteed that all of the computers we are using are going to be in the continental United States. Okay. Uh, but we will absolutely use any other uh, telecommunication product at a customer's request, assuming it's easily available. Uh, typically, that's teams going to be and Teams stuff. or WebEx, yes. Got it. Okay, so you said that continental U.S. So that means you can work from home, but you can't work from Hawaii or abroad. You absolutely can. Alaska. You would just be connecting to telecommunication centers in the U.S. Okay, so as long as you use that VPN, you can live abroad. Precisely. Or, or in this particular case, if you are signing in with your corporate account, it is associated with a, a Zoom center that they have guaranteed is in a certain data location. Okay, I get it. So this is about Zoom, not so much about where Correct. you are. Correct, yes. Okay, uh, sorry, I no, I get confused easily. <laughs> no worries, N not a problem at all. We, we are a worldwide organization. We have offices all around the world. Uh, some of the bigger ones are in Israel, uh, Belfast, uh, I believe. Sun yes, Sunnyvale is our corporate headquarters. We have a very large office in Salt Lake City and uh, uh, others all over the North U uh, U.S. and Canada. Interesting. All right. So let's talk about those uh, first few months. You are, were learning a completely new skill set or were you able to take anything that you knew from the bank industry into this uh, new corporation? So when I was working for the bank, I was an IT expert. I've actually been working in IT since the late 90s. Uh, I, I started okay. out right out of college. Uh, actually, the day after graduation, I was very lucky in that uh, John Hopkins University had, had seen my resume. I ha had applied for a position and they, they flew me down to Baltimore on their dime for an interview. Uh, and, nice. and then immediately after that, I drove across the country with uh, three of my best friends from college. We spent about a month just driving all over. And I think about three weeks in, I called home just to check up on my parents and, and you know, being a college kid, hadn't really thought to let them know I was still alive. Uh, and they let me know that Johns Hopkins had called back and essentially offered me the job. So I had a job waiting for me when I got home from that uh, uh, post-graduation road trip. Was this before cell phones? Uh, yes, it was. So we, we were looking for pay phones. Uh, we had phone <laughs> cards. I, I, so they couldn't be like, hey, you got the job. Yeah, no. Uh, I, they I've, were waiting on you. I, I've essentially just given away <laughs> at least how old I am. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, I'm right with you. <laughs> um, 
it, so, so I was extremely lucky to have a very good job uh, right out of college. Uh, af after that, I ended up working on Wall Street. I was actually uh, right in the heart of New York City, and um, I, I was I was about a block away from the World Trade Center on 9/11. Uh, in, in addition to that, oh my goodness! Um, uh, because of that, th that started some dominoes falling uh, to where I moved to North Carolina. I worked for the uh, state government of North Carolina, and then this bank, uh, and, and now. Here I am with Proofpoint. Um, so I've been in IT since college. Okay. Um, you watched it transform. Yes, absolutely. It, it was very much a, a desktop support, occasional application support kind of situation at the very beginning to the uh, point where uh, I, I help other organizations set up their IT, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the bank skill set translated very well. I, I was the primary, what is called messaging administrator for the bank. Uh, I, I handled pretty much everything email. And, and because of that, it, it was a, a very nice skill set transition to Proofpoint. So we'll, we'll get back to Proofpoint in a little bit. Absolutely. But I want to talk a little bit about your transition. Like you said, it was a little nerve wracking for you to have that customer service um, experience as far as like being online. Um, can you talk a little bit about just the transition to working from home? They gave you some of the equipment that you needed. Did they give you everything you needed? Uh, in a way, yes. Everything physical, everything equipment wise. The, the biggest thing I missed absolutely in that transition was being able to pop my head over a cubicle wall and just ask a coworker, hey, how do you do this? What, what is normally a, a, a 10 to 20 second conversation with a coworker mm -hmm. when you are working from home becomes, let's see, I need to email this person. And if it's the wrong person, they get back to you and they might know who the right person is. And, and through yeah. a chain of emails, maybe two hours later, maybe even two days later, you finally get your, the answer you're looking for. So it, yep. it's essentially every little problem becomes a, a really drawn out process uh, when you first start working from home. Every organization has what I like to call tribal knowledge, where it, it's not written down in a handbook, but you need to ask, hey, I want to change my direct deposit account. How do I get in touch with HR? If you're working in an office, like I said, you pop your head over the cubicle wall, you ask your coworker, and, and they tell you. If you're working from home, you toss something out in Teams, and if somebody doesn't answer, then you send an email. And if somebody doesn't answer, then you send another email. Yeah. I think my husband deals with that more with his line of work. He's um an engineer. Um and when you can physically see someone, like he sits across the way from his manager and like he could just turn his head and just say, you know, or as soon as his manager stands up and like walks out towards him, he can just like pop that question in 20 seconds. But now, you know, it is a little cumbersome. You know, you you're never sure if that person is available or the right person. There's an old joke from when I used to work in an office. Uh, it, it's called prairie dogging. When you see somebody stand up over the cubicle wall, uh, just because that's how they stand up out of their holes in the ground out there in the Midwest. Uh, yes. so, so when somebody's prairie dogging, folks tend to look at that person and, and uh, hey, do you have a question is the kind of expression you have on your face at that point in time. <clears throat> that's pretty funny. That made me think of a very different um, visual there. <laughs> have you seen that movie? What is it? Um sunshine something it, it does not sound familiar everyone else who's listening everyone else has this listening will know <laughs> anyway um yeah that's a real thing did you um did you miss the actual like interaction that you would have had in the office or were you more of an introvert that didn't really so care? if if you put stock in the myers-briggs personality type uh, i i am definitely on the introverted yeah. side of things which is uh, ironic because oh, here mm -hmm. i am on a podcast sharing myself um hey <laughs> but uh, I, I did miss that interaction where if you were having a stressful day, you could go to a coworker that, that you, you bonded with and, and vent for a little bit. It, it is a much more difficult yep. process here. Uh, I have uh, so so my organization is, is a, a large organization. We're talking about thousands of people. Uh, however, I, I have mm -hmm. what I call a, a click. 
uh, on teams where seven of us have bonded. We, we all come from similar backgrounds. Uh, we, we are able to talk and, and share experiences. And uh, most of the time we are discussing work and helping each other out. Uh, but fairly often we are also talking about real life. And, and uh, we've yeah. we've become friends essentially uh, through this. And, and it has taken the place of a, a trusted group of coworkers, essentially where you would be sitting right. in an office and you have the folks around you that, that you probably get along with. Uh, you don't always, you can't guarantee that. Uh, one of the interesting things about working from home is if you don't get along with one of your coworkers, it is much easier to just ignore them and pretend that you're not getting along. <laughs> Or just exactly. Not available. Yes. Uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> part of my job is being available for almost any situation. I, I am a subject matter expert, a, a SME, for a, a few different areas. So, un unfortunately, if if people ask me questions on those areas, I am obligated to answer. Right. Now, when I interviewed Jen, our friend, uh, she would talked about as a manager. She would. I think she has weekly meetings where she just asks people to you know, talk about the problems that they're having and also just real life stuff. Uh, does your organization have something like that in place? Because when I worked for 17 years, well, 10 of those years, I think were from home. We didn't have anything formal like that um, other than a Christmas party. once. Absolutely. Year. Holiday party. What do you guys uh, so, do? Uh, I am in uh, an overall group that is about 50 people total. Uh, I would say 37, 38 of us are, are, are highly technical. Uh, we have a small layer of managers and then some support staff that, that, that are essentially indispensable mm -hmm. traffic cops. They, they route things, they get things to where they need to be. Uh, we have a weekly meeting on Thursdays that is typically technical problem solving uh, or training, but very often the last few minutes of that meeting is, is reserved for essentially venting if you need to. Uh, in addition, I, I am in part of a smaller organization that focuses on extremely specific technical areas. We meet every Friday and, and that group of uh, a dozen of us, uh, we, we uh, excuse me, we absolutely use that uh, Friday time to to discuss real world problems, uh, help each other out with anything. Uh, uh, for example, my my water line between my house and the city water line broke about two months ago, and I ended up having to get a, oh, a dear. plumber out to essentially shut off the city water, dredge my yard, put in a new water line, and and throughout this experience, some of my coworkers who have experienced this sort of thing before or knew uh, enough about plumbing said, oh, make sure they do blah, blah. Uh, you know, w when you talk with a plumber, make sure that they're going to use this type of piping or, or something along those lines. Uh, so just anecdotally, mm -hmm. that is a way where uh, on this hour-long call every Friday, we were able to assist each other outside of work in a very similar fashion to if we were working in an office. Yeah, I I like it. I think that it's good when people um have that opportunity because not everyone would make that for themselves. Um, but do you think that like as an introvert that that feels forced or does that feel very natural for you? It, it's difficult to do. Uh, I I often have a hard time giving a full story just because as an introvert, I think part of my introversion is is what I call getting into my own head too much, where I start to worry about yeah. what other people will think. So I. I I filter or sanitize my thoughts to what I think they want to hear. Okay. Uh, so, so that that is an interesting point that you bring up because working from home, if you are, especially if you're communicating over a text-based medium, that problem tends to compound itself. Where I, I, I will start to type and then I'll delete everything that I typed because I, I think that's not what people want to hear rather than what I yeah. really need to say. Mm-hmm. So I am on the other end of the spectrum. My husband is very introverted, and he um, is a man of little words in public. Um, at home, you know, we're fun. It's hilarious. We share all the things. But um, it's interesting to see him, like, in that kind of setting and, you know, kind of keeps it to a minimum. I don't think he chit-chats, you know, at work, really. Um, he probably is reading the news on his lunch break kind of thing. Um, he's actually on site this week. Every seven or eight weeks, he has to go on site and physically be there when he's on call. And then uh, he, he was there 100% of the time uh, for the first four years or whatever it was that he worked there. And then with the pandemic, they all came home and they gave him a stipend. They gave him um, 
a desk and a chair and a monitor and things. And, you know, he was allowed to bring some equipment home. And so he's been home with us, which is great for us. Um, but he has to go on site every, every so often. There's not very many people on right now. Um, they're actually increasing his on-site presence to once every four weeks right now. They have a team that rotates this on-call and the, the number of people has shrunk. They've had a few people out for other, for different reasons. Um, so it's really interesting for me to have to try to like, think about, well, I, if I had a Friday meeting where I could vent, I'd be like there with my party hat on, like, I'm ready to go. This is like my life. You know, I, I'm, I crave that interaction. And I know for him, it would probably feel very uncomfortable. It, there are varying levels of comfort depending on who is in this meeting. As I mentioned earlier, my overall group is, is somewhere in the mid forties personnel wise, uh, uh, the, the group I tend to interact with is about a dozen people. I would say all but a few of those I, I would be okay discussing just about anything with. And and then again, I, I've kind of fallen in on teams where we've set up our own little chat room where it's it's typically five of us. And th- those guys I could I could say anything to. And, and by guys, th- there is right. one female in there. Uh, uh, so, so those <laughs> folks, I, I should say, to be proper here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, so yes, I, I I am perfectly fine sharing anything with that particular smaller group. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like um, your company encourages that kind of interaction? Like it's not exactly work related. Like overall, do you think that has a benefit for the organization to let people have that hour to talk about other things or? Or are they kind of like top down, like you need to be productive and focused? Uh, on that time? hour meeting, there is often a manager. So if they feel that we need to be talking about work things, they'll direct the conversation in, in that direction. But very often a manager right. will join that Friday call and they'll just simply let us vent knowing that that, mm-hmm. that is a helpful situation. One of the things I mm-hmm. love about my company very much is that they are extremely cognizant of, of the work-life balance. Uh, the, yeah. One of the reasons I am talking to you here today <laughs> is because we were given a, a, what is called a wellness day. Uh, the the, the reason, reasoning behind it essentially from HR was we know COVID is, is a huge pain in the rear for so many people or, or actually a financial hardship for others. Take this day off to get your life in order, essentially. Uh, I, I find that wow. extremely progressive and extremely helpful. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, our, our company absolutely encourages us to contact our manager. If, if you are getting burnt out, uh, let your manager know before you ever even get to that position. Uh, about a week ago, I mentioned in a very large chat with, with that whole group of 45 people that I was pushing 50 hours for this week. And I had a manager that I very rarely speak to uh, send me an email about 20 minutes later saying, hey, Dan, how are you doing? Do you want to have a one on one meeting? Uh, I'm a little bit worried about your workload. I don't want you to get burnt out. Um, Right. In addition to the three month ramp up time when I first started, where I was actually starting to be useful to my my employer, uh, I I did not get to what they call 100 percent load, where I was taking 32 customer hours uh, a week for uh, about a year after I started. So it, it is a fairly significant investment for them. And and if I get burnt out after just that one year, it, it's really not worth it. Uh, uh, when I first interviewed for Proofpoint, I went through seven Zoom interviews uh, and, and, and it, it was a fairly extensive process. And each of those seven interviews was a good hour long. Uh, they, mm-hmm. they feel that they can teach technical skill, but the right personality and attitude is, is absolutely detrimental in, in the hiring process. If they don't think you're going to be a good fit, if they think you're just looking for a, a, a quick pay boost, uh, they won't hire you. Was that all in no. one day? The seven no, no, interviews? this was drawn out over two, maybe even three weeks. When my husband had an interview, he didn't get that job. It was his very first interview out of grad school. And it was seven interviews in one day on site. He drove there and um, it was a significant drive. He could have flown, um, but it was back to back to back to back to back. And he started with one guy. He went to, you know, six other five other people and then he came back for the seventh interview was like a wrap up with the mm-hmm. original person who um intense intense so so you feel as though they they had a really nice transition for you from working your corporate job into 
Th there were some pain points. Uh -huh. uh, uh, one thing I can highly encourage any organization seeking to have a, a work from home workforce is is document to the point where it, it seems like you're over documenting. Uh, and if at all possible, have all of those documents be set up in a logical and ordered fashion because there is nothing more frustrating. Documenting everything. what? HR processes, uh -huh. uh, 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 different team uh, handbooks, different position handbooks, a anything that could possibly be documented, have them in a specific area w where somebody could easily look that up just because of the whole tribal knowledge thing. Uh, when you are mm -hmm. working in a, a corporate environment in an office, Tribal knowledge doesn't become that big of a deal because, as I've mentioned before a, f a few times, you can just pop your head over the cubicle wall and ask somebody. When you are working from home, it, it is, especially if it, it is a, a time-sensitive issue, it, it becomes very uh, anxiety-ridden. Uh, I need to find this out, and I need to find it out by tomorrow. And, and trying to track that down becomes a drawn-out process where it could be five to ten-minute interactions with five or six people, and then all of a sudden, that, that's a full man hour of work. In the corporate world, that matters. Yeah, right. Did you have any paper copies of any of the most crucial things for like your setup, or was everything something you had to access uh, online? Everything was something I had to access online with the exception of the initial instructions that came with the laptop. Basically, I, I got a nice box mm -hmm. from Dell. I opened it up and there was a, a stack of papers of here's how to get online to the point where you can access everything else. The rest of it. Yeah. I remember we used to have to have a, a manual, like literally a manual. <laughs> and um, and it was paper copies for the event of like, if your internet goes down, if you get disconnected, if you have to switch out your equipment, but then they constantly have to like try to send us new copies of that. And they didn't expect us to have a printer to print it. So they would be mailing us all these revisions all the time, which kind of seems silly. But at the same time, when you got disconnected and you couldn't get reconnected, it was important to have, you know, the, the phone numbers of the, you know, the line of command that you would be calling for the IT support and things that you might not have saved on a post-it note or something like that. Uh, that brings up a very interesting point, actually. Uh, uh, when you were working from home, th there is a single digital pipe between you and everything else. Uh, so I, I can't encourage people enough, have some sort of backup uh, available if, if your primary ISP, your, your internet service provider goes down. Uh, I am lucky enough in that I have a phone that allows me to tether. So if my internet goes down, it, it's mm -hmm. a minute later, I'm back online, even though it's much slower, it's yeah. still fast enough to handle my workload. Yeah. I have used that. Um, I teach English online <laughs> as my kind of side gig now. Um, well, it's been my main gig for two years, but I'm transitioning again um, into making this my business. But um, when I worked for Mayo Clinic, I was not allowed to use um, a laptop. At, like I couldn't just go to the coffee shop. I had to be literally in my home office um, because of the the security systems. We're working with you know confidential information, patient information. Um, and they were very picky about that. They actually were very slow to let people work from home because they wanted to make sure they had that security element in place. And then that transitioned over time. Like they went from like the VPN and the virtual computers and the physical online, you know, they did all the different things. Over the 10 years, we probably had to reconfigure everything about five times. Um, when I started teaching online, I could, if my internet dropped, I had never used a hotspot. Um, and I had to learn what that was. And, you know, there's the, I learned a few tricks. Like you can use the Wi-Fi version of the hotspot or you can take a, phys you get the cord. And like you said, you can tether. Is that what you meant by tether? Like get your phone connected to your I, computer? I, I, I think tethering technically just means using your phone as essentially a hotspot for your computer, but uh, you can physically plug it in and, and use that connection instead. I feel like, I feel like it's uh, Absolutely. Uh, the one version. of the interesting things about the, the difference between wired and Wi-Fi is that wired is almost always going to be faster, al although technology is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, wired right. is always more secure. W with with Wi-Fi, okay. you know, theoretically, there are signals going. And you, you never know quite how far they are going to go, and they can be intercepted. Mm -hmm. uh, wired communication mm -hmm. can be intercepted as well, but we're talking about CIA level of, of uh, hacking there. Okay. Um, uh, I, right. I actually use wired connections for everything in my house. I um, try to. You know, yeah. here, here's a good old 
network cable right here uh, sticking out of the back yep. of my computer that I have a, if, if I need. But I, I have a switch sitting what, right next to my laptop. There is a cable going underneath my house all the way back over to the other side of the house where the ISP comes in. And, and I'm extremely mm -hmm. lucky in that uh, I, I have Google Fiber in my area. They're, they're inexpensive oh, cool. and they are ridiculously fast. I, I, I can only dream until the day. <laughs> I have something similar. Uh, here in uh, the Phoenix area, we have uh, an internet provider. They call it Gigablast. Uh, is like the their equivalent or their, their wannabe fiber level You speed. need to look for advertising royalties for both Gigablast and, and Google now that we've both mentioned them. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I can check into that. Um, the I think our internet, the internet provider that I use here is called Cox. And it's, it's cable. I think I've gone, gone through the transition from the DSL. Mm -hmm. Is that right? DSL to the cable and the fiber would be the next thing. But uh, my company always required that we had the internet, um, the router in the same box, or the router box in the same room as we worked because that seemed to make it better. Um, but I know some people that will, you know, basically run an Ethernet cable all the way through their house. Which to me, I'm like, just move, just have your internet people punch the hole into the wall and get it into your room yes. where you are. If I need a reset, I don't want to have to run across the the house. <laughs> I don't want to have to run across the house to see if the light is blinking sure. or not. So let's keep going. Um, tell us more about what we could do to make our our home office more secure, especially for those of us who are in the more entrepreneurial world, like, you know. My corporation told me what I had to do, but now I have to figure it out for myself. Well, to, to add on to what we were just discussing, if you have the opportunity to use wired network uh, over wireless, absolutely use that. Uh, it, it is a couple of hundred bucks worth of hardware and, and a, a few hours reading to figure out how to intercept signals uh, from Wi-Fi. But uh, it, it, again, it basically requires CIA level of hacking if you were going to intercept signals from a, a wired communication format. So, And from a security point, from a security standpoint, it's better, but it's also better absolutely. for speed. Like, especially if you're doing Zoom, um, you know, my kids often are watching Netflix downstairs uh, via Wi-Fi. Um, and so when I have my Ethernet connection, I'm not compromising as much of my speed and the quality of our call. So there's a two there's a two reasons you should do One this. One thing I see very often is, is that people will use their work computers for personal reasons. Uh, I, I can't encourage mm. enough to 100% segregate your work life from, from your home life when you're working from home. If you have a work computer, you should not be using that for anything but work. Uh, anything personal th that you that you do on on that work computer, that is a chance where that work computer could be compromised. Uh, hmm. Like such um, as. So, uh, in interacting with with so many customers throughout the day, like I do, I will very often uh, have a customer sharing out their screen so that I can guide them through configuration processes, and I will see them with browser tabs in the background on on Reddit or ESPN or something like that. And, and if, if you are going to these websites, at the end of the day, you don't know where those servers live. Uh, you don't know if, if, even if it's a perfectly legitimate, legitimate website, if they've been compromised and everything you type is being recorded, or, or, if, or if that website is dropping cookies on your computer and, and those cookies are tracking your information. Interesting. So I, I think when I worked on site, like they over, over time, they kept, you know, taking away things from us. They'd be after a while, they'd be like, you can't use Facebook on your work computer. Understandable from a productivity standpoint. Um, and then, uh, news, they actually said, you can't check the news anymore when you're at work on your work computer because when Michael Jackson died, apparently we broke the internet. Like, you know, Mayo Clinic wasn't working at full capacity because so many employees uh, were were checking the news um, when 9-11 happened. You know, everyone was just checking and checking and checking and, and for good reason, of course. But um, now that we have smartphones, it's, it's a little tricky, you know, like <laughs> you want people to be productive. Um and also secure. My, uh, that, that's an interesting point. My personal viewpoint on that is I have worked jobs where I didn't have enough to do. So I was essentially sitting at my desk board and 
I despise that. I would far rather be over busy than not busy enough. Uh, th that is my personal viewpoint. From a corporate viewpoint, if you were working at home with a work computer, in the vast majority of majority of situations, you don't own that work computer. You, your business does. Mm -hmm. So they absolutely get to tell you what you should and can do on that computer. They can tell you you can't browse to news sites. They, they, can, they can tell you you mm -hmm. can't go to your personal email or Facebook. Uh, in addition, personal mm -hmm. email sites are one of the biggest threat vectors, meaning your personal email, your Gmail, because it is a freeware site, uh, you are not paying for it. It has limited security mm -hmm. compared to your corporate email in most situations. So it is much easier to send through a, a well-crafted phishing email that may uh, convince you to give up your credentials or, or click on a, a link that all of a sudden infects that computer. If that's your work computer, all of a sudden you are now the entry point for, for a hack. Uh, uh, as yeah. we saw, we've seen with so many organizations, uh, uh, Equifax uh, a few years ago, that is a huge deal. And most organizations are not big enough to survive what happened to Equifax. They're lucky in that there's only three companies in the world that do what they do. So uh, the fact mm -hmm. that they, they messed up that bad uh, and, and there's only a few of them allowed them to survive. Oh, yeah, I would not want to be that person. Uh, it, it is an absolute proven fact that email is the number one threat vector for, for uh, information security uh, these days. Does your organization do that thing? Um, I know my husband just the other day, he was like, he's in our bedroom and I'm in the closet um, through the bathroom, actually. <laughs> and he goes, aha, or something like that. And I was like, what? And he's like, oh, I just, um, you know, I just reported a phishing email and it was part of their like, um, congratulations, you didn't get deceived by the phishing that, email. <laughs> you know, you're helping prevent. Yes, that's called yeah. threat simulation. And my company absolutely does that. Uh, Proofpoint actually bought a different company called Wombat, uh, Wombat Security back in mm -hmm. 2018. And, and, and Wombat's entire business line was uh, creating simulated phishing campaigns so that you could test your employees as well as offering training material to teach your employees how not to fall for those things. So we have fully mm -hmm. integrated that into our products uh, at this point in time. And on rare occasion, they, they do that even to, to us who are considered the experts. Um, it, it, it's wow. funny, I, I've had a few coworkers uh, actually click on those links and, and fall for it, but uh, nobody in my specific security area. All right. Um, I definitely was a little bit more suspicious of those kinds of emails when I was at work, when um, they were being sent to me because I'm like, aha, uh -huh. and they weren't always that great. They probably are more sophisticated now than they had been in the past. But um, so are the hackers and the the fishers or whatever you want to call them, the scammers, um, more and more and more sophisticated. Um Industry wide, the, the the bad guys, hackers, scammers, fishers, whatever you want to call them, uh, the, the technical term is actually threat actors, and and we will very often abbreviate mm. it. And different threat actors actually have different assigned numbers. So, uh, and those numbers are typically constant across organizations. So even our competitors will use the same uh, 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 acronym. So it will be TA five seven eight, for example. I'm I'm picking an arbitrary number there, but that could represent one of the major threat actors from Russia or North Korea or one of the the uh, not so friendly countries that loves to, to cause trouble uh, with other countries. Uh, they they have widely known names to the point where industry experts, if you mention TA597, everybody go, oh, they're one of the bad ones, you, you know, a reaction like that. Okay. I remember in the past, I'd be like, well, you can usually tell because like their English might not be very fluent sounding. And now I'm like, mm, I think their English probably will be fluent sounding because they'll just hire someone to, you know, proofread it for them. Or first. They, they may be fluent in and of themselves. I, I, uh, we are... Right. We tend to be moderately spoiled here in the United States and, and typically do not have that strong of a grasp of a second language where everywhere else in the world, they pretty much always are, are fluent in at least two languages. True, true. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in absolutely. addition, with the, with the internet, there are no geographical boundaries anymore. Uh, very often I will mm. be working with a customer and they'll say, so we want to block all emails that aren't coming from the uh, United States. And, and I will bring up the point with, uh, you know, what's to stop a, a Russian threat actor who's compromised somebody's credit card from just buying a, a, or renting a server in the United States. 
It, it, usually they'll mm -hmm. ponder and go, oh, yeah, good point. <laughs> it's not yep. that easy anymore. Uh, there are no geographical boundaries on the Internet. So, so far you've said try to be yes. hardwired. Use multi-factor authentication. I feel like I'm no, saying no, that word wrong. No, no, absolutely. You've got that right. What else? Uh, the, the whole separating your work computer from your personal computer life. Um, right. And be cognizant that email is the number one way in which a threat actor will, will try to get you to click on a link or respond. Um, there are three different types of emails that that we see most often that that are going to compromise you somehow. Uh, the first is basically called malware. That is typically in the form of a, a web link where you click on it and you go to a website. And with the way that uh, modern web browsers work, they can theoretically push a bad file to your computer or they can disguise a good link as something that is going to harm your computer where once you've clicked on that link, you've infected yourself. You've downloaded a file, that file will do really bad things. It, it might steal your credentials. It might start to uh, uh, crypto cryptographically encrypt your organization's files and then ask for ransom, ransomware, it, it, it's called these days. I have like this big gulp because we've got three kids who are online doing school and they're doing research. Like they're researching, you know, my son is writing a paper about bees. And my daughter is learning about the Electoral College, you know, just different things. And even my kindergartner is, I'm helping her, but she wants me to print out coloring pages. And I feel like, <laughs> I don't know, but now that I'm looking for these coloring pages, every once in a while I'll click on one, I'll be like, this site seems a little bit suspicious, but she wants that coloring page so bad, I'm going to click on it and then it doesn't do anything. And I'm like, crud. What just happened, you know? And like, I I haven't always been super savvy and maybe you should learn a lot more about like even just um, putting, like everyone thinks is about like the protection that you put on your computer. Can you talk yeah, about that absolutely. at all? So um, most computers these days ha have uh, at the very least virus protection. Uh, McAfee, Symantec, Kaspersky, those, those are some of the more popular ones. Uh, keep in mind that viruses in modern times represent an extremely small percentage of attacks on your computer. Uh, viruses have not changed since the late 1980s when they were first basically invented, when computer viruses became a thing. Uh, and the way to detect them has not even changed since the 1980s. So, so those are not the biggest threat. So, so Getting the warm and fuzzies just because you see Symantec in the bottom right corner of your computer is is not a good thing. You need to be aware of where you are going and what you are clicking on. Uh, in addition, if if you get any kind of suspicious feeling from an email, it is always better to try to reach out to who the originator purports to be rather than clicking on reply. Right. Uh, okay. So find a different way. Like when um, people, looks like their Facebook account has been yes. hacked and someone's impersonating them. Instead of just trying to message them, I will text Absolutely. them. Absolutely. That is... And be like, hey, did you know? Uh, keep in mind that, that that text point might be the entry point with which their system got hacked in the first place. Um, oh, gosh. It, it, ah. it's, it, no, no. <laughs> you, you have the right idea. Uh, uh, basically try to validate them through a different means. But in, in the corporate world, when we're talking email, it is it is typically... It is typically safe to assume that your corporate email has not been compromised yet. So if you do get an email that purports to be your boss and it looks even just slightly suspicious, hit your boss up on Teams or, or email them directly. Don't click reply and ask, hey, did you send this to me? It looks just, just a little bit suspicious. That tiny bit of, of human spidey sense, as I call it, it can go a really long way in, in protecting you from from your computer being compromised, your work computer being compromised. Wow. So when your boss emails you and you click reply or hover, like usually you can see where the sender is coming from, but like how well can they mask So that? typically uh, there are two methods in, in which you know somebody is sending you an email. That, uh, uh, email actually is very analogous to postal mail in that when somebody sends you a letter, there are two spots where you can see it's from them. One is on the envelope in the upper left-hand corner. That's the return address. The other is inside uh, when you open up the letter at either at the very top of that letter or at the bottom where their signature is. So email has what is called an envelope sender. 
that is actually part of the communication when the email is being transferred from their servers to yours. And in addition, there is the message header from. Think of that as the signature inside on that letter. The envelope sender is very difficult to spoof in, in most situations. The message header from is extremely easy to spoof. Even Gmail will allow you to change the message header from field on an email. So if you are hmm. worried, the, the don't click links in that email. If you click reply, it's going to go to the, the the typically to the envelope sender and not the message header from. So you can very often see after you've clicked reply. All right, is this going to who it says it's going to? Right. But yes. Uh, so as long as if I click reply and I look at that, I I haven't necessarily. Well, I opened the email. Like mm -hmm. they can see that I've interacted with that email, but I didn't click a link and I didn't actually reply to them with any information. I'm just looking when I'm just looking at that sender reply. And no, 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 you, you are, you <laughs> are on the right on. track. Absolutely. So <laughs> hovering over links is, is a, a fairly tried and true method. Keep in mind, there are ways of, of uh, mm -hmm. uh, hiding links of, of where they're going to. Right. Oh, like rerouting uh, or, them or and going stuff? to uh, like Bitly. Have you ever seen the the, the really short links? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, I I never oh, trust yeah. a Bitly link. Um, but uh, right. uh, yes, hovering over something to see if it's actually going there. Um, uh, it, Microsoft does not make it easy to look at what are called email headers, but they can be fairly cryptic and, and fairly technical. Uh, if you have the ability to view headers, that that is good. Uh, Gmail, just their basic product, will show you if messages are coming from who they say they are coming from. There are what are called authentication protocols that allow you to verify a sender's ID in the email world. Okay. So all this talk, I um, I have this little window that I keep hiding. Uh, it's my McAfee alert. And sometimes I don't know what to do with them. And so I just yes. hide them. So I, they don't keep popping up. And I don't know how long I've been doing that. Um, I'm not exactly sure how secure my computer is right now. What do you recommend for someone like me who is like, probably should do something now? After having this conversation, I'm like, uh, it, it, that's Next that's step. an excellent uh, point you bring up. Uh, information overload, especially from security products. If if McAfee or Symantec keeps bugging you that that there's you know a tiny little problem, you will train yourself essentially to ignore everything they say. Uh, it, it's uh, um, it's pretty much a common human experience, and and we are seeing this in the real world today, to the point where we're having this second COVID wave just because so many people have started to ignore the warnings. If the warnings continue for such a long time, they become part of our daily life, and they're no longer warnings. They're they're annoying. Um, it, they don't feel exactly urgent. In, in the same way in the computer world, you're going to get that same type of information overload. Where if your security products are constantly telling you, hey you've got a problem here, you're going to eventually ignore it. And, and when they do actually present you with a legitimate problem, you are not seeing it. it, it it's very much a chicken little sort of situation. The sky is falling, the sky is okay. falling. Well, I'm going to ignore you from now on. Um, right. I'm going to check my message again. I think this one is just a pop up that says, allow us to load our software from the security and privacy pane so we can set up your protection. So I don't know if I'm even protected with McAfee. I have no idea who's protecting my computer uh, right now. I feel like there's more than one. I, I am afraid I cannot speak to that because I am not an endpoint security expert. I, I tend to be an overall corporate security expert focusing on email. Uh, so I don't want to give you any bad advice when it comes to McAfee. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I can tell you in general, typically rebooting your computer is never a bad thing. Uh, you are essentially wiping your memory clean. You, you are bringing it up from a known starting point. Uh, uh, that That is, mm -hmm. uh, there's a reason why when you contact Help Desk, the very first thing they ask is, did you reboot yet? Because that does solve a large variety of problems. <laughs> the IT crowd, did you turn your computer on and off? I yeah. can't remember the exact quote, but um, I restart my computer every day, but I don't like shut it down and turn yep. it back on. Which one is rebooting? Uh, rebooting is is essentially the act of getting back to that initial startup screen. Whether you do a restart or actually physically power it off, wait, and then power it back on, they essentially have the same effect. Some computers have what's called a uh, uh, non-volatile RAM, meaning that it will hold information between boots. Otherwise, how is it going to reboot? Uh, but typically, a restart is just as good as a power off and power back on. Okay, good to know. I use a MacBook mm -hmm. Pro, and it's a SSD. So the what do you, how do you call Secure, it? Secure uh, solid state drive. Solid, yes. 
solid state drive. And so it was very fast. I can reboot or restart within like maybe 90 seconds. Um, and I love it because my computer just works better. Like I am not a tech person, but I know <laughs> if I'm struggling if with, my, with my connection, basically restarting my computer will probably fix that problem. It's a really real amazing thing. So uh, interestingly enough, we've been focusing on the actual physical computer on, on, on the last few topics that we've dove into. Uh, at, at the end of the mm -hmm. day, most of these extremely visible corporate hacking events, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the most recent ones. Um, what was it? Travelocity back in March was, was the big, big one. One of the hotel chains got oh, hacked really? and, and uh, uh, millions of customer data uh, got, got leaked. Uh, Every one of those situations was not the result of a computer hack. Uh, e even the, the big Twitter hack uh, a couple of months ago. I, I don't know if you remember that, where they actually compromised. You're more aware of the, all this they, they than I They actually compromised some pretty famous people's uh, uh, Twitter accounts. But all of those Ooh. were through what is called social engineering, meaning... Mm -hmm. They tricked, they oh, tricked yes. the person into into find this. into thinking that they were a, a trusted person within that same organization. Uh, uh, typically, it is going to be those social engineering attempts that that gain the most leverage. Essentially, because all you have to do is a few hours research, you, you can easily track down the, the, the corporate. Uh, uh, the the work chain at, at of any given organization and and find out hey blah blah is this person's boss and he's their boss so let me contact this person three people down the chain pretend to be this person high up if i can successfully impersonate them i i'm i'm in i can convince them to do things at that point in time so uh really beware of social engineering in which is why i say if you receive anything even slightly suspicious find a different method to contact that next higher up in the corporate chain to, to verify the message came from who it said it is. I saw a video and I, I can't remember who did it, but it was basically, um, maybe you can't hack someone's computer, but I just checked your Facebook um, and I could see that you had checked into uh, a hotel, you know, a year ago, um, you know, your, your location showed where you were um, or that you like checked in and I called um, this, this person, this girl was like, yeah, I called and I think she even used like voice, voice, um, transformation software or something like that. And basically called up and sounded like the dude and said, Hey, um, you know, I have this fight coming up or I can't remember if it was a hotel or a flight. I think she did both. I think she changed his, his flight ticket. She put him from like a, an aisle seat into like the back of the middle seat. And then she like changed his, um, hotel reservation just by calling up the company. And so um, like we're not really talking about internet security right now, but like it's very easy for people to still impersonate you in multiple ways. And I think that would be a way that you could probably hold someone ransom yep, as Social well. engineering. Uh, in fact, social engineering uh, has discovered that they can go directly to the source where high profile targets, celebrities, people who, who handle Bitcoin and, and uh, internet currency, uh, they have had their phones compromised because somebody calls up AT&T or, or, or Sprint or whoever, pretends to be that person. And with just a tiny bit of information, uh, a birth date, last four digits of social, basically requests that their SIM card on their phone be swapped out. And at that point in time, if, if you tell them, all right, switch my SIM card to this one, you essentially have their phone. And, and what do people keep on their phone? Two-factor authentication, their passwords. All they have to do is reach out to, to uh, a company and say, all right, send me my password. And, and uh, very often that'll be via text. Okay, so tell me what you how you feel about things like one pass or last pass or whatever they're called. One password. Uh, last pass. One last password. Pass? Uh, yep. Yeah, password management systems. Uh, they they tend to be an excellent way of organizing passwords. That is assuming the master password is extremely secure. So uh, things that uh, the IT world has learned about passwords over, I, I guess it's been about thirty years since they started being a thing. Uh, one you really need a minimum value. Uh, you want at least eight characters in your password because now that modern computers have a ton of processing power, they can essentially attempt what is called a brute force hack, where they're literally trying to guess mm -hmm. your password 100 times a second and they will eventually guess it if it's less than five or six characters. Uh, 
It, it, it takes mm -hmm. only an hour or two to guess a password uh, throughout all of the different combinations uh, if you are less than five or six characters. Um, the other is don't use anything that even remotely uh, identifies you. Don't, never use your birth date, never use your kids' names, never use your pets' names. Uh, it, uh, I personally use a method where uh, I am taking the first letter of words from certain sentences that are memorable to me mm -hmm. and, and applying mm -hmm. numbers and punctuation at key points that I will specifically rec uh, right. remember. And uh, Yeah, so it's a yep. system that you learned, but not easily replicated. It gives me a mnemonic device, but it does not give an easy, easy entry point to try to guess what that is. Right, yeah. Right. I, I definitely have like a structure, you know, that I can remember, but I have been more and more been using the um, the randomized mm -hmm. ones. Um, and but then I let my computer remember it because how yes. could I? So. Uh, so then it went. <laughs> so my personal recommendation for those password managers is do not keep a copy of the password manager on your phone. Uh, keep them only okay. on your computer. However, keep the two-factor authentication on your phone. That way you have essentially split up the access to that password manager. If somebody ever compromised your computer and they wanted to access your password manager, if they have not compromised your phone, you are still secure. Okay. Whew. This was a lot of information, but good stuff. I, I, I appreciate the time to, uh, to, to allow me to speak about that. <laughs> if, if I can help even one person out there, I, I will feel good at the end of the day. I think we can help a lot of people with this um, because these are not things that everyone thinks about like you do. But, um, you know, a lot of people, it's just like a Band-Aid like, oh, well, I have a virus protection on my computer. So what else would I need? Um, you know, I, I think that obviously people are becoming more and more savvy um, as information gets out. But I think it's podcasts like this or, you know. That video that I watched about social engineering that really like you have to kind of get hit in the gut to take Absolutely. it seriously. Or like we were talking about earlier, that information overload where you just kind of get lazy about it. It's like you turn it off. And like I said, I've been in ignoring this little thing, which maybe is nothing, but maybe it is something that I should probably like make sure that I have something turned on. <laughs> All right, Dan, uh, I usually ask at the end of my podcast, uh, is there anything that you have learned along the way that you think might be helpful that we haven't already talked about? It could just be... Um, a device, like a physical piece or um, a program or something that has just been helpful to you over the years or that you've discovered along the way that might be helpful for people who are just getting started? Um, since we have been focusing on working from home and information security today, uh, I, I can only say uh, never take anything for granted. Uh, uh, always assume, I unless you are 100% sure that, that something is suspicious. Um, uh, there, there is an old phrase that tends to be more of a comedic one than, than an actual seriousness, uh, serious phrase, which is uh, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're at, not out to get me. Oh, uh, right. But uh, uh, yes, so uh, take, take it all serious. And, and I think of everything that we've talked about today, the biggest is keeping your work and, and your, your home computers separate 100%. Never, ever open up mm -hmm. anything personal on your work computer. I think that's good advice. And honestly, even if it's not the hackers who are trying to come out and get us, our, you know, as employees, people who work for a corporation, I remember every single time I logged in, it said, this information is not private. You know, your managers or whatever have could access, you know, your your email. And I mean, like, basically what you say is not private. What you search is not private. And so even for that reason. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, uh, unless you are on a corporate VPN, assume somebody is watching you. That is an excellent point. Yes. Right. All right, Dan, thank you for this time. I appreciate it. And I think it's time thank to you. go. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, that, that you've given me to let me speak. It's been fun. And um, thanks to Jen for introducing us. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. This is April Malone with Dan Wheeler. And this is Yes, I Work From Home. Thanks. Take care. Bye -bye.